Please remain standing for the scripture lesson this morning from Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 34. Then Jesus said, This is what God's kingdom is like. It's as though someone scatters seed on the ground, then sleeps and wakes night and day. The seed sprouts and grows, but the farmer doesn't know how. The earth produces crops all by itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain of grain, full, full head of grain. Whenever the crop is ready, the farmer goes out to cut the grain because it's harvest time. He continued, What's a great image for God's kingdom? What parable can I use to explain it? Consider a mustard seed. When scattered on the ground, it's the smallest of all seeds on the earth, but when it's planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all vegetable plants. It produces such large branches that the birds in the sky are able to nest in its shade. With many such parables, he continued to give them the word as much as they were able to hear. He spoke to them only in parables, then explained everything in his disciples when he was alone with them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to the Lord, Lord our God. God. Amen. Now you can be seated. Boy, I am sorry I'm a little uh, disconnected today. But hopefully the message I have for you will connect you in a, in a special way to you. This uh, metaphor that Jesus uses about planting seeds as being part of our witness is, uh, I think, is one of the more uh, poignant ones and ones that everyone can relate to. And when you think about this was written over 2,000 years ago, and we can fully grasp this idea of planting seeds today. I think it shows you the timeless nature of the Scripture. The Scripture is always dynamic, and it's always speaking to us in the current time. And so I just find this very fascinating and interesting that uh, this idea of the seed, now, you know, a seed, when you first look at it, seems dead, doesn't it? I mean, it's just hard, and there's no green to it. There's no, appears to be no life, but it is a promise of a new life, right? It is life encapsulated within the seed hole. And so we have this mystery of the seed. And there, there are folks that uh, tell me that there are, uh, there are very few or no miracles today because I was in Jesus' time. And let me tell you, there's miracles everywhere you look all the time. Amen? I mean, there's always miracles going on. And I think one of the biggest miracles is the miracle of life. And I've often talked about the miracle of giving birth to a, to a child and, and what that's like, you know, and to be a, a mother or a father or a grandparent and to experience a new life coming into the world. To me, that's a miracle. Or planting a seed in the ground and having it sprout and coming up, that's a miracle. It's a miracle because God has designed it. And the, the scientists and agronomists and all these people can explain it over and over and they know what happens. They just don't know what the life force is behind that makes it happen, except it's God. Amen. It's God that makes it happen. They can explain the sugar and the photosynthesis and all these other things about moisture and ground conditions and all this type of thing. But we can't really tell you that one missing piece is what causes it to begin with. What causes these things to work together? One of the ways we teach children about, about seeds is they'll often plant them in a little Dixie cup. You ever, did you ever do that when you were a kid and bring them home and there's like a bean plant or something and pops through the ground and it's just amazing or I've I've a, a, a not on purpose but unmistakably pulled up weeds around plants and had the seed pop out of the ground you see the beginning of a new plant right the seed is broken open a root shoots going down and I think that is so cool it's kind of like a bird pecking its way out of a shell all of a sudden now there's new life where there didn't appear to be any and so this is an exciting thing and so we know some things about what seeds need but we really don't know, except for relying on the wisdom of God, how it really works. And so the Gospel of Mark in the chapter 4 has actually several parables in a row about seeds. In fact, the first one is a very familiar one about a farmer goes out and spreads seed, and some of the seed falls on the hard path. Now, the hard path is not a good place for seeds to be, because not only is there no rich soil and moisture for them to grow in, but the birds will come along and steal it. And the seed is now gone. And then some of the, some of the, uh, the seeds fell in the rocky soil, right? Some of them fell where it was all rocky. And some of you may have tried to garden in rocky soil, and it's really hard to do. But sometimes the seeds will sprout, 
and they'll, they'll start to grow, but, but because their roots can't go down deep enough to get to the water, they soon wither when the hot sun comes out. And so then, then the third example he gave, this is Jesus teaching the disciples and the people. If the third example is that the seed falls into the thorny bushes, and the seed will sprout and start to grow up, but, but it gets choked out by all the weeds and all the thorny shrubs all around. It can't survive. But some of the seed falls on the rich black soil, and it gets the right conditions, and it grows. Well, then Jesus goes on to describe what this parable means. And it says in Mark that he tells the disciples separately. He doesn't say this to all the people. And that's a bit of a mystery to me, but I think it's because they weren't quite ready for it yet. But he wants the disciples to know what the parable means. And so he explains to them, well, the seed is the word of God, right? The seed is the word of God that you're called to do. As you go out from your, your churches and your homes and out into the community, your, your, your call on your life is to share the word of God, the fact that God loves all people, that God accepts all people, that God wants to be in communion with all people. And so this idea that we spread this good news wherever we go, that's why it's called the gospel, the good news of the Lord, is that the Lord loves all people. And, and it really frustrates me sometimes when, when the gospel gets distorted and it gets more about judgment than it does about good news. And let me tell you, it's mostly about good news. There's judgment, of course. But the good news is the primary message, the fact that God loves you and God accepts you. And then Jesus explains each of these. And so the, the path is a bad place because the, the birds, and he equates the birds to Satan. that will come and snatch the word away from those that hear the word but aren't quite prepared for it. Then he talks about the, the rocky soil and how the, they, they're choked out. Uh, the, the roots are because they can't go very deep. And they talk about the thorny bushes and, and how the thorny bushes compete for the same nutrients and the same water that comes down and the, and the seeds can't grow. And you think about it in your, in your life. If you've got too many distractions in your life, it's hard for you to focus on God because you're too focused on all the problems you have. And Jesus says, you, worrying is a waste of time, right? You don't add a single day to your life in fact, you're probably shorten your life, as the doctors say now, if you worry too much, because the stress will take you over. And so sometimes we allow the thorny bushes of life to take over and keep us from hearing this good news that Jesus has for us. And so that's the, uh, then the, then the, the fourth one, of course, is the fact that there are some seeds that do fall in soil that's ready. And that means people that are ready to hear the word. And it may be us, right? Sometimes this is us that we hear the word, we hear God's good news, and we, thir we flourish because of it and we produce much fruit, meaning that we continue to show the love of God to others. We continue to witness to our faith wherever we go, that other people will know of God's love because of our example, because of what God has done for us. We continue to share that wherever we go. And then he, the, sec the, the uh, third parable, the second parable, excuse me, in there, because one is the path and the, the rocky soil and all. And the second one uh, has to do with the parable of the lamp. And so many times we take these uh, individually and we don't look at them as a group. But this is, I'm looking at all of Mark 4 here to kind of give you an idea. He says, who would light a lamp and put a bushel over it or put a basket over it or hide it under a bed? Who would do that? Well, that, that doesn't make any sense, does it? You light the lamp and you put it on a lamp stand so it lights the entire room that everyone can see. That the lamp light is like the seed, right? The lamp light is shining the love of God to others. That others will see God through your witness, through your light shining to the world. And so this parable ties in with the first parable. And then we get to today's parable, the one we, we read for you. The one about the farmer goes out and he plants the seed. And, he, you know, we, we, we anticipate that he's prepared the soil and he plants it in the right places and the, and the rain come and all the things that need to happen. And he goes back home and he, and he sleeps at night and he works during the day and days go by and the plant grows, but the farmer doesn't really know how. It's the miracle of the growth of the seed. It's the miracle of new life in Jesus Christ. It is a miracle that if you go and you tell the right people you're about God, that's in some of those people, it will grow tremendously and produce great fruit. And that's our call to continue to witness about Jesus to wherever we go, to continue to show others about God's love through our actions, through our love, through our forgiveness. That as we continue to plant these seeds, some of them will be in the right conditions and they will grow. 
and they'll continue to produce. Then he goes on to the next, the next uh, parable, which was about the mustard seed. And he says, even a, a mustard seed, which he says is the tiniest of all seeds. Now, this, this, is, uh, this is a figure of speech, okay? Because we know the mustard seed is not the tiniest seed that exists. But it was like, you know, we've, this, is an, this dates me, tells me, tell you how old I am. Remember we used to say, what's bigger than a bread box? Remember that expression? Well, it's using a common known item to give you an idea of size. And so since a mustard seed was common, and there was an expression at that time, it was smaller than a mustard seed, or it was the size of a mustard seed, meaning that it was a tiny, tiny bit, okay? And so if you plant a mustard seed, even a mustard seed so small can grow into a mighty shrub, even big enough for birds to, to nest in. This is, this is to remind us that no matter how small you feel like your witness is, that, that, that it, even though you don't feel very significant in the world, your little bit of seed, your little bit of witness is enough to change people's lives. Amen? You can change lives, and you will through the power of Jesus Christ. This is the power that he's given you, no matter whether you feel like you're powerful or not. This is one of the things that I struggled with when I first became a pastor is that, is my witness strong enough? Do I have, did I have enough bad things to happen in my life? I can tell you all about it. And I realized, you know, that's not what it's about, right? But some, some preachers, you'll get this idea that it's really about remembering the horrible things they went through. Well, if you come from a, a life that was pretty nice like mine and you didn't have a tremendous amount of horrible things in your life, then you wonder, was well, my witness significant? And you may be in that situation too, but your, your witness is significant. Your witness is absolutely significant. It's all powerful. It, this, even if it's only the size of a mustard seed, it's enough to make a difference. It's enough to grow the faith in someone else. And so today we're talking about this idea of planting seeds and not really knowing about the results. In fact, one thing that I think we get uh, caught up in sometimes is talking about how many people we've witnessed to or told about our faith and how many of them have accepted Jesus Christ's uh, grace for their own lives, that they too have been saved. We talk about this sometimes, but I, I, I don't talk about that a whole lot because I don't have anything to do with that other than I planted the seed. You see what I'm saying? I don't make that happen. I could never say, quote, I saved people because I never, nobody here ever could. The only thing you can do is to share your faith. The only thing you can do is to plant the seed. The only thing you can do is water and till it and take care of it and do the things that it causes, that causes people to uh, relate to what you're saying. And you, the rest of it's up to God, amen? The rest of it is God's work. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's where we have to have faith. And so we continue to shine our light as the parable of the lamp or we continue to plant seeds. It's the miracle of God's growth. It's the miracle that God can work through this message, through your actions, that others will know of God's love too. And so we're called to continue to plant our seeds, right? To continue to share our faith, continue to tell people about God's love, continue to allow the Holy Spirit to work within them. And sometimes we wonder about how is that actually happening? And, and you know, it's, it's kind of tough. Um, Jennifer and I both had uh, classes in seminary about evangelism. How do you how do you talk to people about Jesus so that they actually believe it? They make it part of their lives. And you know, there's all kinds of theories about that, but it's really not all that complicated because we can't take ownership of it beyond our witness. That's where we have to take ownership is our witness. And if we say, well, I, I don't want to share about my, my faith because that's a private thing and I don't really want to share it. Well, I don't know. As Christians, we really have a choice, do we? I mean, we're told this is really what we're called to do. We're called to make sure other people know of God's love. We're called to make sure that they, can, that they can see that God accepts them for who they are. And this is difficult in our world because we, we have a world that's rampant with, uh, with racism and, and xenophobia and there's all kinds of things that happen out there that, that people reject other people and they think they have every right to do that. And I say, aren't they a child of God equally important as you? Amen? Absolutely. And so we must look at it that way. So we, we need to to work on our relationships with one another. The way to really witness to someone is, is not to say the first thing out of their mouth, do you know Jesus? The first thing I want you to do with them is to develop a friendship with them, help them to know who you are and that you know who they are and eventually they trust you. And then when you say, you know, I really find my hope in Jesus Christ through his good news, they're going to be willing to listen to you. 
But if you jump in there first, you're way ahead of the game. They're not ready to hear. They, you know, people care about people that care about them. They listen to people who they consider a friend. And so you develop friendships first. That's the first thing. The second thing is being honest and genuine with your own life. You know, I think it's real important when you witness to others to tell them about the fact that you don't understand everything. I, I would tell you, tell you that any day you ask me. I don't understand everything about this. But I do trust that, that the Holy Spirit will guide me. I trust the Holy Spirit will help direct the words we say and will help direct the actions we take. So you have to be genuine in your love for others. You have to be patient. It's like the farmer that has to go home and wait day after day for the seeds to come through the ground. And I remember planting gardens when I was a child and or watching the fields around here get planted. And you do have to be patient for a few days or maybe a week or so until the seeds start, start coming through the ground. And it's, uh, it's hard to be patient. We want instant fixes, and instant fixes don't really happen. And they're, they're, they're something that we have to wait on. We have to wait on God's timing. And then we have to be kind. We have to show true kindness to one another. We have to show true kindness to those people, that, especially those we have a hard time being kind to. We have to think about what is it that we're doing that maybe is not the most kind thing. And so we are living... We are a living manifestation of God's Word. We are continuing to witness to God about our love for God through the way that we share this love with others. You know, sharing God's love does produce transformation. You know, our mission statement of the United Methodist Church is the mission of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the what? Transformation of the world. The, 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 the witness or the mission of the United Methodist Church is to share the love of Jesus Christ and make disciples for the transformation of the world. That the world will change if everyone followed the principle set by Jesus, like the what would Jesus do bracelets we used to wear. I mean, if everyone did that, we would eliminate an awful lot of the problems. That's why Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Because if you love God and love neighbor, you're not going to break any of the other Ten Commandments or any other rule you want to come up with because all of those things are based on love and respect for other people. They're based on love and respect for other people. And, you know, we have to fight for justice as well. That justice is sometimes lacking in our society, that there's, there are people that are continually oppressed and, and quote, good Christians sit by and do nothing. And I'm guilty of that as much as you, that we must seek justice for all people. In fact, in Micah, the prophet Micah wrote uh, in Micah 6, verse 8, He has told you, O mortal, what is good, meaning God has told them. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God? That we are to seek justice in all things. And I can't help but think about this situation along the border where we have children being taken away from their parents and putting in detention centers. This is not just. Now, I don't know what the right answer is, but that part of it has to stop, amen? That part has to be fixed. We can no longer treat people as aliens that are not welcome in our borders. This is something that we must find a solution to. And it's something as Christians we've got to speak out about because God is very clear about this. This idea of, of showing others people, other people grace in uh, Exodus chapter 23. Uh, God is saying, do not oppress an immigrant. You know what it's like to be an immigrant because you too are immigrants in the land of Egypt. That we are all products of uh, being immigration, right? We have all come from somewhere else at some point in the past. And we all must look towards that in order sh to show the kind of love and grace to all, to all people. I'm not saying that we... We don't have any rules about immigration. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying we, they must be just. They must be fair. They must not single out people and treat people differently. Jesus said that uh, whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me, right? That if you don't treat the least in the world the way you would treat the best in the world, then there's something wrong with that because all people are created equal. Our country is formed on that idea that all people are created equal in the eyes of God. And for us to separate them in such a way that truly oppresses people, that puts people in a very difficult situation, no matter if they are whatever country they're from, we need to look at that. Because Jesus himself said in Matthew 25, 35, I was hungry and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. 
we too must be welcoming. We too must be reaching out to others to allow them to know God's love, to, to know the generosity that he's shown to us. We must be, be able to show to others. You know, so many people, when you plant seeds, they'll reject God, and, and it's frustrating to us, right? It's frustrating we tell people that God really isn't trying to condemn you. God is showing you love. But you know, so many times people reject God because they feel that they have God, been condemned by God, that God has somehow pushed them aside, that they're not, they're not worthy of God's love and grace. And we must be the people that step beyond that and say, that is not what the Scripture says. We must be willing to accept all people. Now, we don't have to accept everything they do, okay? This is not, I'm not trying to make that distinction. But what I am trying to say is that we must be willing to step out and be a voice to be heard, a voice to be heard that this, the injustice that happens around the world, we must be part of the solution. In Luke 6, 37, it's written, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. We must show that all people must make sure they know that, that every person in the world is a child of God. Whether they know Jesus yet or not, they are just as much loved by God as we are. And that we can't hold ourselves above other people. We can't reject people because we feel like they're not uh, worthy of the seed of truth, the seed of hope. You know, I, I got to thinking of the, back with this metaphor of the seed. You know, we're, we're the farmhands, right? We're not the owner of the field. We're the one that works for the farmer. We're the one that goes out and plant the seeds for the farmer. But we don't own that field. That's God's field. That's God's field. And, you know, we're the planters. We're the planters, but, we, but it's God's the one that transforms the seed. God is the one that transforms the message into new life. That other people will know of God's love because we've continued to plant the seed. We've continued to go out forth and do that. You know, we're an ambassadors of God's grace. We are the ambassadors of God's grace sent into a world, sent out into the world in search of hope. Amen.